Good morning, everyone. Um, I don't know if you downloaded the, uh, the question app. If you just go right to menti.com, enter that code, you'll be able to respond to our questions. The first question is, you can read these on, online on your phone, and then you'll have to toggle to the next screen to actually answer the question. I'm glad we have some funny people in the audience that answered that. <laughs> so while you're doing that, I, I went past my disclosures. Um, I'm actually a member of the HIV uh, NIH Guidelines Committee, but the, uh, my points I raised today are mine and mine are alone, even though I'm going to present some of their uh, recommendations here. Also, I do receive, Yale receives grant support from Viv and Gilead, for which I'm the PI of. Oh, thank you. And I'm also uh, the up-to-date author for a couple um, drug resistance chapters. So I'm glad to see 41% said a lot of patients with complex medical issues and it's difficult to choose a, a regimen. Uh, and a lot of people, 33% uh, are hoping to hear about the new uh, agents to manage complex patients. So that it tells me we have a very experienced audience here, which is very good, HIV uh, treaters. Uh, and then the other one, about 13% just want to learn something new, which is great. Uh, and it's hard to keep up with it. So I can see that about 6 or 13%. Thank you, Wilco. So what makes a patient complex for you? So I get asked by a lot of my colleagues, and, and so I started querying them before we came here uh, for this meeting, and I get resistance, DDIs, adherence, pregnancy, and you, see, you can see there's a number of different responses. But this is sort of a word jumble of all the different uh, combinations, and certain themes really emerge from this. Really, drug resistance is a big player uh, when people have trouble managing a complex patient. Side effects, adherence, drug-drug interactions, CKD, polypharmacy, aging, pregnancy, all these uh, have to be factored in when we're managing these patients. So first, I, I'm going to address the patient situation. Many of you, it sounds like you deal with this every day. Patient adherence is, is a big uh, factor of it, and especially if they have underlying comorbidities that affect it, such as substance abuse, mental health disorders, or uh, neurocognitive impairment. Unstable housing, psychosocial factors, such as missed appointments, d uh, no car. Interruption of uh, or inter intermittent access to ART, the cost, and um, many of my patients will say, because I live in the Northeast, the weather, incarceration, the co-pays are all come into effect of why they have trouble taking their medications. And obviously drug adverse effects, which we'll hear more about today, and also high pill burden and dosing frequency and food requirement with some of the more complex regimens. Also comorbidities, which David will talk to us about some today. And uh, I can't go through all these today, but I just wanted to let you guys know you guys can download the NIH app, aidsinfo.com, uh, .gov, sorry. And there's a nice table in there that I'm sure Dan actually helped develop when he was on the guidelines panel uh, of each one of these comorbidities and what would be a good regimen to use in those patients. And so we won't have time to go through all this today, but maybe we can uh, go through some of them during the Q&A session. But just download that app and that, it's a very uh, nice tool. So also our patients are aging, so the aging population really adds complexity to our patients. And oh, there's over 300,000 patients currently that are over the age of 55 uh, living with HIV in, in the United States. And so you have to really pay attention to bone, kidney, metabolic, and cardiovascular, and liver health in the uh, elderly. And I shouldn't say elderly because I'm over the age of 55. <laughs> um, polypha polypharmacy is very common in older patients. You have increased risk for drug-drug interactions. And that can either decrease the absorption of, your drug, of the drugs, increase the actions of the drugs, or actually cause adverse effects. And the DDIs, you should really, you're going to have to assess them each time that we change a regimen, and we'll walk through that a little bit on, on one of the cases. 
So what are some of the HIV-related factors? Uh, obviously, complicated drug resistance burden. Transmitted drug resistance is, is a problem in the, in the United States and secondary transmission, which we'll talk about in a minute. Also innate resistance to some of our uh, agents, such as the uh, CCR5 antagonist, if the patient has a C CXCR4 tropic virus, or if it's HIV2, where some of the drugs don't work against HIV2. But the take home is integrase inhibitors and protease inhibitors do work against HIV2. And also a high pretreatment viral load actually can impact the response to the different regimens that we choose. What about the regimens themselves, regimen-related factors? Obviously, suboptimal uh, pharmacokinetics, variable absorption, possible penetration into reservoir sites, such as the HIV uh, uh, into the CSF. And you can, and many of you uh, probably have had patients that might have had isolated CNS escape. And then suboptimal virologic potency. Um, many of our aging patients have been exposed to early era combinations. I have a, a number of patients that were on monotherapy, then dual therapy, then the newer triple therapies, and they, they've actually survived, and they're, uh, uh, so they have very complicated resistance, but it was mainly because we treated them with suboptimal viral potent regimens. And obviously, again, the reduced efficacy due to prior suboptimal regimens. And this happened a lot when, back in the 90s, we would actually add a single agent onto a failing regimen because that was the only thing available. Um, uh, and also low genetic barrier to resistance based on some of the regimens that we use. But some of the newer generations have a very high genetic barrier. So what's complex for me? And this is a typical question I'll, I'll get in clinic. Uh, hi, Mike. This patient who has A and B comorbidities and has resistance to X, Y, and Z uh, drugs, they have failed two previous regimens. Uh, I only have the most recent genotype because the patient came from out of state. Uh, they won't use T20. Uh, I'm thinking of using this regimen, X, Y, Z, U. What, what do you think? And my easiest answer is, have you thought about a clinical trial? But the tough answer really is, and this is what we really have to deal with every day, is, well, you can try that combo, but it's not formally been studied in this situation. We should get some more information. And the provider will say, why hasn't the regimen been studied? What else should I get? And that's where I'm going to help you. So how did it get so complicated? So currently, we have seven drug classes, 29 agents, and over 20 fixed-dose combinations. And this is the year of approval of these agents. And you can see in 2018, there was a huge influx of fixed dose combinations, mainly because the ability of um, uh, some generic drugs became available. But it really has uh, increased our complexity. And so for those of you, how many were math majors? Oh, good. There's one person that might get this question right. <laughs> Tells you why we all went into medicine, I guess. So. We usually choose three drugs to actually put together to treat a patient. So I want you to go through this uh, thought experiment. How many different desserts can you get from a menu of 10 items? And you could replace that to 10 ARVs. And this menu only has 10 choices. How many possible choices do you think there are? This is the formula. I have to tell you, a high school student did that was shadowing a physician, and he did this in his head in front of me, so I just realized now. <laughs> Hold on, I'm getting 120 possible combinations. So what if you're looking at a treatment experience patient, and you want to try to use 20 different drugs? You can see the complexity is enormous. And it's very important, and Dan, I think, is going to address this. Most most of these combinations have not been studied formally in a clinical trial. A lot of them are the licensing agents. They use specific agents and the like. But it's become very complex for uh, the provider to actually understand, I'll put this drug together, that drug together, and, and see if it will uh, work. But many of these regimens have not been formally studied in a clinical trial. So what tools do we have to understand uh, the HIV variants that are uh, infecting a patient? Obviously, viral load, genotype, and phenotype. Proviral DNA. How many of you have ordered a proviral DNA genotype? Oh, good. Oh, a couple. 
So I, that hopefully I can uh, explain uh, a couple of that for you today. And obviously HIV tropism. And we're going to just touch briefly on these to try to set them, us up for the uh, subsequent uh, talks. So first, just virologic definitions. I just want to make sure we're all on the same uh, 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 level. Two viral loads greater than 200 after 24 weeks of therapy is virologic failure. Incomplete virologic response, you never achieve a non-detectable viral load at week 24. Low-level viremia is viral load uh, that's less than 200, but greater than whatever your lower limit of your assay is. And a virologic blip is one where you get uh, a rise and then it returns back to non-detectable. And that becomes important when we uh, talk about different possible cases. So in the United States, this was data presented by the CDC at CROI this year. Unfortunately, 19% of patients have, are infected with drug-resistant virus in newly infected patients. And secondary transmission in many cohort studies, also, uh, especially in Europe, have actually shown that secondary transmission actually is a problem. That means one person transmit to uh, uh, a, a new patient, that new patient doesn't know they're infected, and they transmit the drug-resistant virus uh, further on. But integrase inhibitors, the, the uh, transmission of drug resistance is still only around 1% in the United States. But there was just a recent report in New England Journal this summer about a uh, clinical course, I, this was in Europe, uh, of patient primary failure with dolutegravir containing regimen. So integrase inhibitors, we have to continue to watch for this being to see if there's any signal. So how do we test for resistance? It sounds like many of you know how to do this. We use the, it's recommended for all patients as they enter into care. We use genotyping. This allows us not to have to culture the virus. We amplify the gene regions of the, the drug targets for, and we sequence and look for mutations that will confer drug resistance. The drug resistance mutation, Jonathan's, this is, uh, Jonathan's part of this group, the uh, Stanford database. The mutations are listed uh, here for a, a, a case that we'll uh, go over. Uh, and then algorithms are used based, we weight these mutations. Every drug that's actually submitted to the FDA has to submit the resistance profile and what mutations confer drug resistance to their compound. And then the algorithms, uh, they give a weight to the mutation to help uh, determine what, how much uh, reduced susceptibility it causes to a drug. And the reason why they have to use algorithms where there was a time that Charles and, and uh, Jonathan and Dan knew every single mutation, now there's over 100 possible mutations. And I showed you just the combination for 10. Imagine if you had 100 different mutations and the possible number of combinations. I think the di it's 157 digits long. I can't even say the number, but that's how. So it's complicated. So you need, you, we, there's a reliance on the algorithms. So strategies to identify a complex patient Resistance testing should be formed to uh, assist in uh, de uh, detecting drug resistance. And we do it at virologic failure and at, with the viral loads greater than 1,000. And I want to point out that the assays in the United States are only approved if the viral load's greater than 1,000. But you can still attempt to use it, but that, I just wanted everybody to remember that they're only approved for viral loads greater than 1,000. But our guidelines recommend everybody with a viral load greater than 500 uh, should uh, viral uh, resistance testing should be attempted uh, because it would meet the uh, criteria of virologic failure. Obviously, in suboptimal viral load reduction after week 24, you should test. And then recently, uh, in the CID this uh, summer, uh, the International AIDS Society came out. And they made an uh, interesting recommendation. They said a viral load greater than 200, you should attempt a viral genotype, and maybe we can ask the panel if they uh, agree with that recommendation. And they point out that it, the likelihood of it being successful is around 70% of the time. So, but I'm going to talk about some other tools you might be able to use to help with that. So uh, when you do a resistance test, you should do it when the person's on therapy. What happens when you take a person off therapy or if they've stopped therapy, the virus will start to, if a person has drug-resistant virus, that's what these red squiggles are supposed to represent, a K103N for NNRTI resistance and 184B for 3TC or FTC. The virus will start to back mutate and also the wild-type virus will outgrow the mutant variants because those mutations may cause a replication uh, capacity issue for the virus. And so if you test a person when they're not on therapy, 
the, vi the virus might have gotten below 20% level, which is what the Sanger sequencing can get optimized and go down to. And why that's important is that if you put a person on therapy, the virus that's resistant can rapidly reemerge and cause biologic failure. So you can attempt a, a viral genotype even more than four weeks off therapy, but you just have to remember it may not be uh, detecting all the resistant variants that are there. So genotyping, uh, genotypic testing in the United States is preferred over phenotypic testing, um, especially for first and second line failures. Or in patients, you assume that the resistance mutation is not going to be complex. But adding a, a phenotypic assay to a genotypic ass assay can be very informative and be very helpful in these complex patients because it will actually measure what impact those mutations are having on the full susceptibility for that virus. The reason why we don't recommend it first line is it takes about two or three weeks. It's more expensive than genotyping, but it is very valuable in these complex uh, patients. So how do you approach a patient? The first thing you do is assess adherence. And some of the simple tools, you know, the ACTG and the Insight group uses a three-day recall or a seven-day seven -day recall, how many um, uh, drugs have you missed, and also script refills have also have been shown to help with uh, judging a patient's adherence. Then you should assess drug-drug and drug-food interactions and drug tolerability. Hopefully you can all see that all these links are available to you to help you uh, uh, walk through this if they're, if they're available. I don't know if we'll make these available. I know we're going to make them available online. Obviously, you should monitor the HIV viral load and CD4 count trends over time. And importantly, and a take-home point, is you need to evaluate all the ART history, all prior and current resistance results, and create a cumulative resistance burden when you're deciding what is the uh, uh, best regimen for the patient. So this is a... Uh, uh, a little review we did for the federal practitioner for all the uh, physicians that take care of HIV positive patients in the federal government, in prisons and the VA and, and uh, 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 FQHCs, federally qualified health cl clinics. And now we'll just apply this. So say you have a patient on, that has viremia and the viral load is greater than 500 and, and they're failing in the ART, you should First, assess adherence, drug-drug uh, interactions, and if any of the comorbidities are contributing. If you confirm that the viral load is greater than 200 on two occasions, that is virologic failure. And with that, you should obtain a viral genotype, consider an HIV phenotype, depending on what level, if this is their second or third uh, failure, and uh, you can consider a CCR5 tropism test, which we'll talk about. And, but you should use the cumulative results to decide on how to construct a regimen. And a guiding principle in treating these patients is a new regimen should include at least two, preferably three, fully active agents. And we'll talk about that if you can't construct it as well. And then obviously get expert advice if needed. So tools to evaluate tropism. How many have ordered a tropism test? Yeah, I thought so. a lot more. So remember the virus in, in early disease, most of the viruses are CCR5 tropic, and they use the CCR5 co-receptor to, to, after it binds to the CD4 cell to enter the cell. Later in disease, the virus can also use the CXCR4 receptor. And we can determine which receptor the virus is using uh, either by the, the phenotypic recombinant virus assay, or we can do it by next-gen sequencing of the V3 uh, region. And then we use, again, algorithms to predict co-receptor usage. And why that's important is we have drugs that actually uh, can block CCR5, and, uh, and you want to only use those drugs if that's the only type of virus that's infecting the patient. So the first point from the guidelines, proviral DNA tropism testing, which we'll talk about, can be utilized for patients with an undetectable viral load, and you are considering using a CCR5 antagonist because you want to switch them off a toxic regimen or, or a regimen they're having trouble with. So I'm just going to walk you through. This, was, uh, this is from the uh, NIH guidelines. We give it a C3 rating. That means optional and it's expert opinion. But if you have a person that's suppressed, but they're having trouble because they're having some type of toxicity or, or they're on an older regimen, and you want to switch them 
you can do proviral DNA resistance testing or you can do tropism testing. These tests can provide useful information of, about the virus that used to be circulating in the patient. And because the viral load is suppressed, you can't use the standard plasma-based assays that are testing for HIV RNA. And these proviral DNA assays can be considered for patients, particularly if there's complex or semi-complex pre-existing resistance expected. And when the assay is obtained, results should be combined with all the previous ones as well. It's just an additional tool that you can use. So I just want to make a point about proviral DNA testing. So this is really what we're looking at. We're looking at the proviral DNA in the CD4 cell. So the assays that you can order here in the United States, they only send about four mils of blood uh, to, the, to the company to run it. Now, in four mils of blood, you only have about eight million cells. About two million uh, PBMC, peripheral blood mononuclear cells are in a mill of, plas uh, mil, mil of whole blood. And that, but that makes up CD4s, CD8s, CD19s, monocytes, natural killer cells. But what we really want to focus on is the CD4 cells. So really, there might only be about four million CD4 cells there. And in a suppressed patient, there might only be four to 40 proviruses sampled. And this is data from uh, Sarah Palmer's group where she looked at virally suppressed patients. And, uh, and she uh, estimates that only one to 10 intact proviruses in, in, these, in, in the CD4 cell subsets. So what am I trying to drive home with this slide? You're really only getting a very small sample of the virologic burden when you use these proviral DNA tests. So if they give you an answer, they're helpful. If they don't give you an answer, you have to worry that you may not be getting uh, the whole picture. So our guidelines now recommend you can do proviral DNA testing in a number of situations. And I'd love to see if the panel agrees with these. So I mentioned about if you're switching a patient. Also, if you have low level viremia, say you have a viral load of 60 copies and it stays there and you can't do a standard assay, you could try proviral DNA testing to see if uh, genotyping is available. If you, if, if you can determine if the patient is resistant. And it can also be considered in patients experiencing virologic failure greater than 200, and if a person's not on uh, uh, viremia. And what, why is that, a, uh, you'll say, when is that situation possible? Some patients actually have low virus and, and you can't actually uh, get a good sample, or the, the assay just fails and doesn't work. But results should be interpreted with caution. These assays might miss some or all pre-existing drug resistance mutations. So they're a good tool, but they're not a great tool. But, but it's just another thing that we can use to evaluate patients. But again, just to drive this home, important virologic assessments in a person's going uh, under uh, virologic failure, genotype, phenotype, CCR tropism test. And then, if you need to, get expert advice and then start two and preferably three fully active drugs. A common question I get is uh, this one. A person's not on therapy. They, they had been out of care for about three to four months and they know they had prior drug resistance. You try to get the old records from on the patient, prior genotypes. You order another uh, genotype on the patient to determine if they have uh, harboring drug resistant virus. And if you get all that, those assessments, you can follow our guiding principle of starting two and preferably three active agents. However, if no prior genotypes are available and only drug-sensitive virus is present on the, on the current genotype, you can restart the old therapy, but you have to evaluate the patient in about two to four weeks to see if they actually are responding. So, so a couple more uh, general principles. In general, adding a single agent to a failing regimen is not recommended. This will increase the risk of development of resistance to all the compounds. Some ARVs, though, have partial activity and they can still be retained in a salvage regimen. And, and I think Dan's going to talk about that. Some of the NR, NRTIs, PIs, and integrase inhibitors have that uh, characteristic. But for some patients that are heavily treatment experienced, Maximum biologic suppression may not be possible. So what do you do with those patients? Well, ART should be continued and designed to minimize toxicity, prefer, uh, preserve CD4 counts, and delay clinical progression. 
Stopping ART is not recommended. Inc there's an increased risk of disease progression. And if you can, refer the patient for a clinical trial to get access to a new a drug that has a new mechanism of action. So the goal of treatment in a person failing therapy, if they're heavily treatment experience, is to suppress the viral load to non-detectable levels. It should be, ART should be changed as soon as possible to prevent ongoing replication and further resistance development. And virologic responses are more likely to be more robust if the viral load is lower and the CD4 count is higher. A new regimen should include two, preferably three, fully active agents. And a fully active agent is expected to be un have uncompromised activity based on current and, uh, and past uh, drug resistance uh, results. And a new agent with a novel mechanism of action uh, has been shown to really be a robust way to actually try to resuppress a patient. And again, to drive this home, make sure you get a cumulative resistance uh, genotype to help you construct the new regimen. So this is just sort of a summary, a complexity. This is a complexity weight uh, graph where each patient is different. One patient, drug resistance, this is supposed to weight it much heavier. Age might be lower. Other patients, chronic kidney disease might have a bigger impact. This is the kind of patients that we deal with. Uh, and some of the patients we have are pregnant or they want to get pregnant. And so you have to weight these all differently for each patient. But the goals are the same. You want to suppress the viral load to non-detectable levels, construct a regimen the patient can tolerate, won't cause drug-drug you know, interactions, and won't worsen any underlying comorbidity, and get expert advice if needed. And luckily, we have Dan and David and John and Charles to, to help us with that today. So I'll stop there. And should we hold questions? A couple of questions if there. Does anybody have any questions on, on that? So do you want to weigh in? Uh, Mike, I have, I have a question. Yeah. Um, you refer to patients who are, who are lost for control and then come back and you don't have all your proper information. And then you, of course, recommend to do a genotype in that patient to get an insight in what resistance may be uh, present. Do you have a preference for RNA or DNA genotypes in, in those particular patient populations? I think that's an unknown question. I, I would do an RNA, uh, but some people might, we'll see what the panel thinks, that you could possibly also do a proviral DNA. And we are recommending that, it's C3, that you could possibly use that uh, and, and to get a fuller assessment, especially if you think there's probably a resistance there. Uh, I think it can be very, very helpful. But the first, my first step is usually to repeat the RNA uh, a genotype first, and then I, I'll consider proviral DNA. Okay, I'll Oh. Okay, I have a question here. Thank you. Adil Bhatt from Wild Cornell, New York. You mentioned pro-viral DNA. Um, you said that if you don't get an answer, it doesn't mean, that, uh, doesn't mean much. But if you do get, a, get an answer, it, it can help you. But would it be accurate or could it be a misrepresentation because of sampling error even when it is positive? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I really didn't have a time to go in there. If you should, remember the slide I showed you with the replication competent virus, actually the number of viruses that are in that archive reservoir, most of it is replication incompetent. So you don't know if it's actually in a replication competent virus or in an incompetent virus. But I think what it tells you is that at some point in time that virus had that mutation. So I, I use it. I think it's a useful tool to do it. That doesn't mean it's a fully replication virus that's living there, but I think it's actually very helpful. And, and, and yeah. so, so yeah. One final question. From that point of view, then, you would suggest patients in clinical trial who fail but are less than 200, do you think would be reasonable to include that as part of the clinical trial, then? Um, I think we're recommending it could be a tool. I, it would really be up to whatever clinical trial is being designed. I think it, is, it can be a useful tool. If you have low-level viremia, which is a very, I'm sure many of you are experiencing this. You have patients with low-level viremia and you really want to know, is this the one, the one patient that's going to fail? Most patients with low-level viremia, only about 16% actually go on to overt virologic failure. And so this tool might be able to tell you which ones that is. But there's no studies of this to, to show that. So Mike, thank there. you very much.